Hi, uh, my name's Simon. Um, I, I'm here to talk to talk about Flatpak and uh, why Debian should be using it. Um, I work at Collabora, which is an open source consultancy, um, mostly doing uh, stuff with the GNOME library stack and uh, building Debian derivatives. Um, and at the moment, I'm working with Valve, exploring how we can use Flatpak to improve Steam and SteamOS. And uh, hopefully Debian. So, um, Cosmo touched on this in his talk a few minutes ago. Uh, Flatpak is a sandbox app framework for Linux. Uh, it was previously called XTG app, but that's kind of unwieldy, and the lead developer is from Sweden, so it got renamed in honor of IKEA. Um, it is an app framework, so um, it's very much focused on desktop apps. Uh, the sort of thing you would find in your app menu, um, user share applications or whatever. Uh, or alternate, if you like, um, the sort of app you would find in an app store. So like Android or iOS or um, that kind of thing. Um, very much leaf packages, not, not um, anything that stuff depends on. Uh, they are sandboxed. Um, obviously, if you've installed one of these apps, you trust it enough to use it but you don't necessarily trust it completely and you don't want it to get into PGP keys. And it is for Linux, or if I'm being more pedantic, GNU slash Linux. Um, it makes no attempt to be portable away from that. It makes uh, full use of glibc features, Linux features, um, things like namespaces. Uh, it can use systemd to put um, each app in its own scope, but it doesn't have to. Uh, all the SysVNIT fans can be happy about that. And it's not specific to a particular distribution like Debian, Fedora, Ubuntu, SteamOS, whatever. So, uh, one of the things it provides is stable platforms to run your app. Um, distributing an app for generic Linux is a bit of a pain. Um, there's a horrible term, ISVs. Uh, independent software vendors, and they might they might think, well, we can target generic Linux, like we can target Windows or MacOS or whatever. But it's kind of problematic for them to do that because all the distributions have different packaging systems, they have different library versions, they have different sets of libraries installed. So the traditional answer to this is you pick some ancient version, uh, traditionally old version of Red Hat. Um, these days, an old version of Ubuntu. Um, you assume the system is going to have the most common libraries from that baseline, and you bundle in the rest. So you statically link your binary, or you play games with R paths to get the libraries you want linked. Uh, the LSB was an effort a while ago to define like a, a standard baseline that uh, LSB app vendors could um, choose to depend on the LSB instead of on a particular distribution. Um, and that's all very well up to a point, but it doesn't have a particularly complete li library stack available. And um, I spoke to uh, Didier Raboot about, uh, about this the other day, and he said there's like four or five LSB apps in the world that anyone actually shipped depending on this. So it's kind of a waste of time. and you should maybe go to his talk about getting rid of it. Um, and if, I, if, I, if um, ISVs can't use new features we add, then you could kind of ask, well, what benefit are they actually getting from open source? Uh, we have new features, uh, fixed bugs, whatever, and may maybe five or ten years later, they can feel safe, actually, depending on this new stuff. So um, this, this concept of the platform problem where you treat what you're depending on as something immutable that you can never fix it, you just have to work around it. And if ISVs are using this old baseline, it makes sure they have the platform problem forever. And even when they do the right thing and help us fix our bugs, um, add new features that they want, that kind of thing, uh, they still have to wait maybe five, ten years before they can rely on it which is a pretty big disincentive for them to actually help us. And of course, they have to be responsible if they bundle libraries for keeping them up to date with security. 
and some ISVs do this well, uh, others bundle a library and forget about it forever. This is not what we want. But it's not just ISVs who can benefit from having an app, frame, app framework. Um, there is some software in Debian that um, we treat it like the rest of Debian. We, we run it on a two-ish year release cycle. Um, we have a, very, a wonderfully stable platform. And that's kind of useless because this software gets to six months or a year old and nobody wants it anymore. Um, and at the moment, we're not amazingly good at solving that problem. We have backports, uh, but they, and, and they, they solve it partially, but they're, they're not really a particularly complete solution. Um, we have a policy that they have to come from testing. Um, but testing is by definition what we are preparing for our next stable release. And if the app is sufficiently fast moving, like has to change every six months to deal with uh, new web APIs or something like that, then maybe it will never be suitable for a stable Debian release with a two, three year lifetime. Um, so we can't put it in backports because policy says so. Um, it has to be able to cope with its dependencies coming from the version of stable that we're targeting backporting onto. So for instance, if it's using new features from GTK or something like that, um, it needs to be able to cope with that old version for the entire lifetime of, of that stable cycle. Or we can backport the dependencies, but then that's kind of a problem. Because um, if we try and backport something like GTK to make our backported app be able to use it, uh, yeah, well done, we've just destabilized two-thirds of our supported desktop environments because they were not expecting that new GTK version. Um, and if you're sufficiently willing to take that risk, then okay, maybe that's fine. But in that case, what are you doing running stable? And wouldn't you be better off with a rolling release, which, for better or worse, is not what stable provides. So flat pack runtimes are um, flat pack's answer to this. Um, instead of um, using the slash user from the operating system, um, the flat pack runtime is basically another small copy of slash user. And this is with the, with, um, the, the user merge. So it includes uh, the equivalent of slash lib, slash bin, slash sbin. Um, so you get your runtime linker and all that from your runtime, not from the real system. Um, there is nothing kind of magic about runtimes that means um, only like some approved flat pack vendor can ship one. Anyone can make their own runtimes. Um, when you build one, you choose what libraries you'll put in it. You choose what version numbers you want those to be at. And your flat pack, lab, flat pack app sees only the runtime. It does not see your real slash user file system. So whatever set of libraries your app has declared it depends on, that's what it gets. Uh, the runtime does not need to contain development tools. Um, you don't use it as you know, like your real operating system, so you don't have to have your debugger and things like that, your compiler. Uh, it doesn't have to have a package manager. Um, you, ship, you ship new runtime versions and kind of forget about them. So you don't need to be able to install new packages into your runtime to update it. You just install a new version of the same runtime instead. Um, it doesn't need to be able to boot, so you don't need init. You don't need anything system related. It is essentially just libraries and a few executables. So uh, the maintainers of Flatpak produce a couple of reference runtimes. Uh, these are uh, initially built using uh, some horrible Yocto thing. Um, and then a stack of libraries are built onto that using Flatpak built tools. So there is what they call the free desktop platform which has all the sorts of libraries that a vendor might have traditionally assumed you had, like libjpeg, zlib, bz2, that kind of thing. Um, it also has like the lower level parts of what you might call the GNOME stack. So you get gstreamer, you get glib, I think you might get gtk, uh, but nothing higher level than that. And you also get Python. So it's enough for a reasonable number of sort of portable apps to run in. If you want more than that, you can have bigger runtime. There is the GNOME platform, also from the Flatpak maintainers, 
which adds in like the rest of the GNOME library stack, like libsoup and um, extra widgets, things like that. Um, KDE have been experimenting with producing their own runtimes, which are a lot like the GNOME runtime with less GNOME, more KDE. Mm -hmm. um, and Fedora produce a runtime, which has um, all the libraries you would get in a standard installation of Fedora, because unlike Debian, um, a standard installation of Fedora is a thing that it makes sense to talk about. Um, and we could soon have Flatpak runtimes uh, built from Debian uh, with Debian um, packages dependencies in. And um, there is interest from Valve in um, potentially producing a runtime that resembles uh, the Steam runtime that they have now, which is um, a library stack pulled in using LD Library Path, uh, which is what Steam games are expected to assume. So this is all getting kind of tedious, let's have a demo. So um, I'm installing some stuff from uh, FlatHub, which is like the... Um, can you increase the font? Zoom. Uh, I can try. Better? Yeah. Better. Huh? <laughs> no, it's too big. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> um, so um, this is coming from um, ostensibly from FlatHub. If um, if Flatpak is like the Android app framework, then FlatHub is like the Google Play Store or something. It's it's like a central distribution point that you don't have to add, you don't have to enable, but a lot of people probably will. And it's meant to be like the obvious place where you where you distribute your app or where you get your app, and also where you get your runtime. I'm actually using a local mirror of it on my laptop because I don't trust conference Wi-Fi. Um, and because I'm using this local mirror, I've turned off the GPG verification that it would normally have. Um, because I've only got a subset, so I don't want to go signing my subset separately. Uh, so I'm installing MindTest, which is a knockoff of a popular game involving cubes. Um, and it is, it is automatically picking up the free desktop platform, uh, also coming from my local mirror of a flat hub subset. So here we go. Uh, as you can see, the free desktop runtime is not small. Uh, it comes out at something like 160 meg for 64 bit Intel. Um, and having installed this and thought about it for a while, I should eventually get a game. I don't know why my SSD is being so slow today. Um, it's the font size. Yeah. It's, it's the, the font, font size. size. <laughs> Repeat the joke. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth repeating. <laughs> right. There we go. Finally. <laughs> So uh, now that I've installed this app, um, obviously uh, a like, ordinary user of Debian might well you'd be using GNOME software or something like that to install this rather than arcane command lines. But arcane command lines are easy to demo. And having installed it, I can run it. Uh, I already have a world generated. And apparently DevConf 17 is a rather nice beach with no trees. So there we go. That's a flat pack app. Um, and SDR really does not work at this font size. So uh, if I rerun this, um, here I've overridden the um, command line used inside the app container. So instead of run, actually running my test, it's just run bash. And this gives me a shell inside the app environment. Uh, you can see that I have a slash user which contains a whole bunch of libraries. Uh, it is based on this uh, Yocto thing that has a pile of packages available. Um, and then the free desktop platform builds on that to add 
for example, well, there's some build tools which aren't actually present in this copy, um, but there are also things like drivers and ZNT to pop up dialog boxes, uh, that kind of thing. So not a particularly small runtime. And in, over here in slash app, I have the parts that are actually mine test. And there's an executable. Uh, there are some bundled libraries. So the free desktop um, platform does not include this game library libirlicht um, for some reason. Uh, it also doesn't include a lure interpreter. So mine test has had to bundle those two. And my home directory, as far as the app sees it, it looks pretty empty. And um, you can see that my real home directory here is not visible. There is just the bits used by my test itself. Um, that's part of the sandboxing, which I will come back to. So with the, along with each runtime, you need a way to compile stuff. And um, to do that, uh, we have the SDK which is a, another runtime, but a, a rather larger one. And this one does have the development tools. It's got the compiler, it's got your header files, all that kind of thing. And the conventional naming is you give your platform runtime a reversed domain name ending with .platform, and the corresponding SDK is .sdk, so like um, org gnome SDK or whatever. Um, this would not be a whole lot of use if your game was running on uh, if your game or your app was running on um, an unspecified version of GNOME, because then you're back to, well, what am I running on? I just don't know. So we have branches. Um, so, uh, for instance, the um, current stable version of the GNOME text editor, gedit, might depend on um, this week on version 3.24 of the GNOME platform. And um, then when, it, when it's, or it's author or app vendor uh, rebuilds it in a couple of months' time when GNOME 3.26 is released, uh, they can decide at their own pace to switch branch to GNOME 3.26. So for instance, GNOME has uh, these ver uh, versions, this by which GNOME version it is. Um, Fedora um, aligns theirs with um, the Fedora release. And coming soon, um, Debian-based platforms which are based on a branch of Debian. And I don't think it makes sense to have like the Debian runtime, because what would you put in it? Does it have particular libraries? Mm -hmm. You can have anything in Debian with the universal operating system. So uh, I think it makes more sense to have um, a smallish number of um, runtime, uh, of, of runtimes for particular purposes. So the, the prototype I've done is the games runtime which um, has some of the libraries you would need to play a game. As you've seen with um, Liberalicht for uh, my test, um, not everything gets included in the, in the runtime. Um, in principle, we could build a separate runtime for every app containing exactly the libraries it needs. Um, this would be a lot of runtimes, but if we script it, maybe no big deal, and they get deduplicated, so it could be fine. But I think we probably don't want that. Um, so instead, the app ends up bundling some extra libraries. Um, partly this is used for uncommon libraries, so my test bundles Liberalicht because there are not many other games that use that library. Um, but also some apps are developed very much in lockstep with a particular library that they make heavy use of, like um, events that no PDF viewer is pretty much developed in lockstep with um, its PDF renderer, I believe, Lipoplum. And if the maintainer wants the very latest version of that, they can drop it in Outlib and know that they have it. The app appears in slash app. Um, canonically, you do this by rebuilding it from source and giving it a different prefix. You do the same if you're bundled libraries, um, slash app, like overrides slash user. Um, unlike some app frameworks, like for instance, um, app image and I think snap, uh, you do not have to make sure your app is relocatable. Lots of people have their, uh, designed their apps so that paths are hard-coded at build time. And um, Flatpak's like, um, pragmatic approach to this is, well, that's fine. You can hard-code it if you want. Uh, we're never going to relocate the app to some random path. 
Um, it will always believe it's in slash app. And you'll notice slash app is the same length as slash user. I don't think this is coincidence. So if you really need to, you can take your hex editor to your app and replace the references to slash user with slash app and you're good until you need to do this again for the next version. How these get deployed, um, as uh, Cosmo said in his previous talk, um, Libostry is uh, like Git but for libraries and operating system files. And it looks quite a lot like Git, so you have your configuration, you have some branches, you have some hashed storage. Actually, I lied, that's just Git. Here is Ostry, it looks very similar. Uh, the branch names are kind of weird because they include the app name and which branch you're on and things. Um, you can add remotes, so Flat Hub or whatever is a remote from which you pull branches. And the objects are hashed with, I think, SHA256 instead of SHA1, but it's basically the same. Um, the, uh, the, the, way, the way this is made to work is um, the sandboxing layer of Flatpak sets up a new app namespace. So, um, as far as your host system is concerned, there is no um, slash app, there is no um, view of this runtime in a specific place. But um, the, new mount, the new mount namespace for the app uh, creates a tempfs, creates the mount points, and mounts the runtime and the app in the right places for it to be able to see them. Um, this is also how it gets its special view of your home directory with only the files it's meant to get at which is part of the sandboxing layer. Um, it uses a tool called bubble wrap um, to make sure your valuable stuff is nicely protected. Um, there are several reasons you might want to sandbox your app. Um, you trust the app's author enough to run it, so it's got some like um, attack surface there from it can make system calls, although they are restricted. Um, but you don't want it to have complete control of your system, which is what you have right now for a typical app installed from source or from a Debian package or whatever. Um, the app solver, even if they're not malicious, might have made a, made a mistake that someone malicious can get in through, or they might have bundled an insecure library, which we don't want. So um, the, the way Fl Flatpak does this mostly is with namespaces. Um, so creating a like, virtualized view of users, processes, the mount table, um, networks, you can deny networking to your app, that kind of thing. And on some Linux platforms, we can just use these, it's fine. Um, the feature in question is up from the user namespaces. But unfortunately, user namespaces are kind of scary because um, we have an unprivileged user and suddenly it gets all the capabilities in the new namespace it's created. And in principle, um, the Linux kernel is meant to um, not let um, users with capabilities in a non-init namespace do scary things. But people miss stuff, and um, this CVE I've mentioned here was one where um, if you created a new network namespace, you got network admin access in it. With your network admin access, you can install netfilter rules for firewalling. And there was a buffer overflow in NetFilter. So you could um, add crafted rules that would let you overrun a buffer and overwrite stuff in the kernel, which we don't want. In upstream Linux, um, there is one config option for this. You can have it on or you can have it off. So in, for instance, Ubuntu and I think Arch Linux is just on. And if there is a vulnerability that this exposes, they will just have to deal with it. Uh, in Debian, um, our esteemed kernel maintainer looked at this and went, ha ha ha, no. So we have a kernel patch. Um, unprivileged user namespace creation is not allowed by default. Um, there is a syscall you can twiddle at runtime if you want to enable it at the cost of more attack service. And in, for instance, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, um, they have a similar kernel patch, but in their patch, it's a boot parameter. So if you want to change this, you have to reboot. So the result of all this is you can't portably rely on being able to create these namespaces. This is kind of a problem for Flatpak, which wants to be portable and wants to use them. So we have Bolra. Um, it's a small set unit executable, designed to have minimal attack surface, 
Uh, it doesn't use fancy libraries, for instance. Um, it was originally, uh, back when Flatpak was STG app, this was uh, part of Flatpak. But it was spun off into a separate project because um, other things want this feature, it turns out. So it gives you a subset of the full power of user namespaces. Um, it is enough for Flatpak. It is enough for um, some of the other things that Red Hat's Project Atomic does. And hopefully, uh, a lot of the projects that want to use namespaces in practice will be happy with Bubble Wrap. But it is not as powerful as the full attack service the kernel gives you. In particular, it will not execute user code until it sets this no new privs flag, which means um, it defangs set you at executables, basically. So you can't um, craft an environment in which a set you at executable will do something unsafe because as far as your confined app is concerned, the set you at executable is not set you at anymore. And the, the, the design principle is it doesn't um, make too much it doesn't have too much reliance on being set UID, so it doesn't allow anything that its, or its maintainers wouldn't like to see in the upstream kernel. Um, so the intention is this could hopefully go away one day. Um, Flatpak builds on this by having a sandboxing model. Um, the, there is a list of capabilities for each app for what it's allowed to do. It's the same principle as Android permissions where you have your list of, um, this can send SMSs, this can cost you money. Uh, so for instance, here are the permissions for a fairly typical 3D game. Um, it shares the network and IPC namespaces, so you can play multiplayer and you can talk to Pulse Audio. Um, it's got, it has the sockets necessary to output video via X11 or Wayland. And it has the DRA devices, so it can do fast rendering. Um, if we want to escape from the sandbox a bit more, um, there is this concept of portals. Uh, name solved, Val, thank you. <laughs> um, so these are a way of um, getting out of the sandbox with user consent um, without having to declare this access in advance and then have it available for abuse whenever. So we've all seen the browser security warnings do you want to blah, 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 I don't understand, blah, 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 yes. <laughs> but um, when these things are done a, in a less complicated way, it's reasonably clear um, what's going on. Your hangouts.google.com wants to use your microphone. Well, yes, I hope it does, I'm making a call. <laughs> um, I think I may have to skip this demo because I'm running out of time, but um, one, of, one of the core portals that's actually available with Flatpak is um, the document portal, which um, presents a normal, um, no more KDE style um, file open dialog or save as dialog. Um, but the dialog box is actually outside the app sandbox. And whatever you select in it, that's automatically made available um, to the app via a fused file system. So um, as far as the user is concerned, they're just choosing a file. If they don't know that necessarily making a trust decision. Um, but they are giving the app access to that file, they've said so, it's fine. Um, and so the right, thing, the right thing happens. And um, it's difficult to do sandboxing and have it work well without modifying your apps. But one of, one of the key insights in developing Flatpak is that it's enough to, mend, to modify your libraries. So if your app is using a recent version of GLib and GTK, it will just automatically use this document portal if it detects that it's inside a sandbox. So that's quite convenient. Um, these, um, very briefly, work by um, contacting the host system. They have filtered access to the DBus session bus. Uh, at the moment, Flatpak has this slightly nasty proxy which looks at all the messages and decides whether to allow them. Uh, I have an ongoing project to integrate uh, this filtering and sandboxing into DBus daemon so that we don't have to have a proxy. <coughs> But one of the things that's automatically allowed is talking to these portal bus names. Um, and the, the implementation of most of these is a thing called XDG Desktop Portal, which I also maintain in Debian. Um, and there is meant to be only one implementation of this, um, but it delegates the actual work to a per desktop implementation. So if you're in GNOME, you'll get your GNOME file open dialog, but if you're in KDE, you'll get a KDE looking one and so on. So, how can we improve Debian with this? 
Um, first thing to say is this, this does not replace the majority of what we do in Debian. Not everything we ship in Debian is, is something you can call an app. Um, the entire system layer, uh, your network management and your logins and your init system is way outside the scope of Flatpak. And in particular, Flatpak and the portal implementations have to be outside Flatpak because chickens eggs. Um, also, um, the platform layer per user is not something that can be considered an app like this. So, like GNOME Shell is not an app. It's part of the trusted computing base for um, people who use GNOME. Um, all the little services that um, things like GNOME use are also not something that can be presented as an app. They are outside these sandboxes. Um, distros have to provide these. Also, most of my command line interfaces, development tools, servers, that kind of thing, um, these aren't really in scope for Flatpak. It doesn't make any attempt to be suitable for them. Um, you can use similar techniques for them. The namespace thing is exactly how Docker works. So if you want your server in Docker, that's fine. It's, it, it's not Flatpak's job. One of the things we can do for um, Flatpak is um, just at their best, uh, distributions like Debian um, have a series of well-maintained apps where the uh, Debian maintainer of the app is worthy of the name and is really maintaining. Um, is an expert on the package um, and knows what's going on with it, even if the upstream is not as responsible as we might hope about, for instance, fixing their security bugs. Another thing we can, we can do that really helps Flatpak is uh, we, can help, we can build the runtimes. Uh, we're very good at libraries in Debian. We have a lot of policy around them. Um, they're stable, they're secure, um, we don't break stuff. This is exactly what you want when you're building a runtime. You, you want your library to keep working. But distributions are not perfect. And some of the time, um, when we're packaging our app, when we're packaging apps and making them available to our users, it's kind of a little bit pointless. So um, no minds, for instance, the um, no uh, minesweeper game. Um, sorry to pick on the GNOME team here, particularly since I'm a member of it, but um, most of the uploads of that package are just in the upstream release. So you can kind of ask, well, what value are we adding to this by packaging it in our distro? We're making it available to our users, but that's kind of a thing of our own making. We're not actually fixing any bugs. We're not actually adding any new features or anything. We're, we're just turning the handle on packaging. And um, another pretty good or depending on how you look at it, a pretty bad example is Zonotic, a multiplayer first-person shooter. Um, it's not clear what value we add to this because it has been stuck in intent to package state for over five years. And um, okay, in an ideal world, maybe we'd have a package of this and it would be very well maintained. But in the world we actually live in, um, a flat pack of this coming from upstream is going to be better for our users than a random binary coming from upstream. And a random binary coming from our upstream is better than nothing at all. Um, so we, we can get access to potentially quite a long tail of applications um, by enabling Flatpak and using Flatpak versions of them where that's the best answer. This does not need to be either or. Um, some of um, Cosmo's thoughts on Flatpak at the end of his talk um, kind of made it sound as though we had to choose one. We don't. Um, we, can we can have some of our apps come from upstream directly and be in a flat pack. Um, for apps where we are generally helping, adding value, fixing bugs, fixing security flaws, uh, we can have those come from Debian, either in a flat pack or just as a package. And these two can coexist and we get some of the same advantages, whichever of these we do. So for instance, if our app is coming from Debian um, in flat pack form, we still get the sandboxing, and that's quite a big win. Um, time check, please. Thank you. Right. So um, the thing that uh, is new here that we haven't historically done, but now we do is, um, or now we can, is I've put together a prototype of using Debian for runtimes. So, uh, 
much like before, I'm installing Flatpak from a local web server. Uh, but this time, the package I'm installing is um, Debian's version of Open Arena. And this is pulling in uh, the, the Debian games runtime, which uh, as of a fortnight ago didn't exist. Um, as you can see, this runtime is significantly smaller. At the moment, it just, just includes enough for Open Arena. Um, I haven't included, for instance, Python or GTK or anything like that. It will probably get bigger over time to support more games, but hopefully, will hopefully still be smaller than the Freelance Top runtime. Uh, while I'm waiting for that to install, I will go back to here. Uh, so, um, I've, I've, I've um, recently done this, this tool I'm calling FlatDev, which is a prototype of uh, piecing together a runtime or an app from app to depackage packages. Uh, okay, Open Arena is kind of big. Um, so the idea is, um, for the runtime, we can do a debootstrap, um, get a minimal copy of Debian, and then um, just install a bunch of packages into that. Uh, if I open up a new, uh, new tab here. So here is a, de a description of um, what goes in. Um, Sync. Um, yeah, so this is a description of what goes into the, game, the new games runtime um, in addition to what's in a minimal debut strap. So we've got exactly the libraries Open Arena needs right now. Um, as I said, it will eventually grow. Come on. Um, similarly, um, there is a declarative description of where we get this stuff. So in the, uh, the base runtime includes an app sources list, uh, which pulls in Debian and security updates. And then uh, I also have a description of the game itself. Um, this is quite similar to the um, JSON files that Flatpak Builder uses, except in YAML, because that has nice things like comments. And um, all of, all of this stuff with um, the arguments um, enabling permissions and things is exactly what you'd get normally with Flatpak. The only difference is I'm building some packages here um, from source. I've had to modify them slightly to be relocatable. And I'm also pulling in some um, packages using apt. Uh, have I installed? Yes. Good. So here we go. Uh, the Quake 3 Arena engine, and uh, if you can see the version number down at the bottom there, this is Debian's Open Arena with fixes and stuff. And you really can't see that on the screen, but um, take my word for it, that version number is the one from Debian with all the security fixes, and not Upstream's release from 10 years ago or whatever it is. Um, and similarly, um, if I go, if I get a shell in there. Uh, you can see that I've got a rather different set of libraries and um, here I am and, uh, in the app um, I have um, just what we need for that one game. Um, so the simple case is your app is already relocated. Some apps don't hard code paths and then you can just install the dev, move files around, job done. As it turns out, Open Arena and Airquake 3 are not like this. They need some small changes. We need to build it with a different prefix. Um, so my current prototype is um, using build profiles. There is a, now a package.flatpak.app build profile, which requests to put it in slash app. And uh, the dev helper maintainer um, seems to be interested in standardizing this a bit so that for like auto tools, it will automatically do the right thing. Uh, there are various alternatives to Flatpak um, for the situations where um, Flatpak is just not the right thing, uh, which um, I don't think I have time to go through, but if people uh, want to ask about a particular one, um, please let me know. 
and uh, slides and such will be going up shortly on flatmap.debian.net. Any questions? I had a couple of questions. First one's probably easiest. Um, wouldn't Tor browser be a good candidate for handling in this way? Funny you should say that. I was talking about that on Hash Debian Develop quite recently. Yes, okay. Tor Browser would be an excellent candidate for packaging like this. Because it, um, it seems to kind of already work that way. Yes. It, 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 um, it gives you synchronous notification of uh, up, uh, update availability outside of the other notification systems. Yes, so the Tor Browser launcher package is kind of a hack. It's um, forcing the Tor Browser into our packaging model when it doesn't really fit, it's like square peg round hole. Right. Um, and I, th I think it would be much better if the Tor browser people um, published a flat pack uh, repository with um, their browser binaries and either a, a runtime or used a standard runtime like the free desktop ones from FlatHub or maybe a Debian published one if they prefer Debian. And then we could just install the flat pack, run it there's your Tor browser, and um, secured by PGP keys, just the same as apt, mm -hmm. and um, it would be nicely orthogonal to how you do app, apt updates for your platform. Uh, my other question, real quick, it, it probably has a short answer. Mm -hmm. um, do you not think of what ends up on a Debian system either with just all packages of a priority standard or higher, or alternatively that which uh, you get from task cell if you don't select any tasks at install time? Wouldn't those be candidates for, you know, uh, a standard Debian uh, release? Because you said we don't really have that well-defined uh, contra Fedora, for instance. Um, or is so it just too lean? what you get from a task uh, when you install your tasks in DI is a fully working, bootable Debian system. And for a runtime, we don't actually really want that. Oh, it's too fat. Okay. Uh, we don't need the boot process because that's in the platform layer. That's not our problem. Um, uh, if you have a look at the source code of FlatDev, it, it actually um, strips out the init system and apt, and the very last thing it does is to call dpackage purge dpackage. Right. Okay. <laughs> because we don't need it, right? Yeah. Dead weight. <laughs> um, but you're, you're right that Debian standard is um, something we could have as a runtime, or the libraries from Debian standard, but it's not clear to me that that's very interesting because that is only enough to host client line applications. You don't even have things like libjpg. But at the same time, you do have things like E2FS libs, which, who wants that, really? Um, you know, you, you have to have a fairly specialized app to want to be able to poke at a X2 file system. Um, so, yeah, I do have a base runtime, which is um, essentially standard, I think. But I don't think it's a particularly interesting target. I think something like games or the known desktop or that sort of a package set is a more interesting one or Steam Runtime. Thank you. Can you speak a little about the implications for resource requirements? I'm thinking uh, disk and virtual memory and other things. Uh, yeah, okay. So, um, yes, if, if you have multiple uh, Flatpak runtimes installed, uh, you will consume a bit more disk space because they won't have perfectly aligned versions of libraries and you will have the version of like GTK in your runtime um, duplicating the version of GTK in your base system which is not necessarily the same. Um, so yes, there is some disk cost. You saw that the free desktop um, platform runtime is about 160 meg. Um, the better we get at reproducible builds, the less of a problem that will be because if your binaries are identical, um, OS tree will deduplicate them. Uh, I believe um, Endless, who, you, who layer Flatpak over OS tree, actually share one repository for both of them. Yes, they do. So if, by coincidence, they have the, exactly the same version of GTK in their runtime and in their base platform, uh, that will be the same file hard linked. And uh, presumably, they try reasonably hard to make sure that, in fact, they do have the same version a lot of the time. So a lot of the time, in practice, they don't pay that cost. Do 
you happen to know if caching of uh, shared libraries uh, is deduplicated across Flatpak instances? Flat pack. What do you mean by Flatpak instances? Uh, you're running a bunch of different Flatpaks on one system. Is that going to consume additional virtual memory uh, for all the sets of libraries, or is there is the kernel smart? I don't know how it works at the kernel level. My guess is because it's the same inode, it should be able to know that it only has to cache that file once. Um, but yeah, I haven't checked that. Um, if we have, if an application is already relocatable, say because it uh, follows XDG um, data dir, mm -hmm. uh, could we then build flat packs directly from devs and not from source packages? Yes. With just the information added about what the, what sandboxing that we pass. Yes, so if we look at my um, open arena here, um, one, of the, one of my build steps is to build Earthquake 3, one of my build steps is to build the open arena um, game code, and the last build step here is to install the data files, um, which are just inert data, so they are already relocatable, um, and FlatDev just parses this list and installs all the packages. Um, if my entire game was relocatable, I wouldn't need the source steps, I would just include the game engine and the game code in this list of packages and they would just be pulled in, moved to app, job done. Um, I have another one uh, like this in the flat dev repository which is GNU Hello, uh, which is relocatable because what does it even load? Um, and that one does literally just um, unpack the package and move the file. So there we go. That is all. It does not compile it from source. Thank you. Uh, I just had a question about versioning. Mm -hmm. So when you make a flat pack runtime, you can specify all the versions of all the things in that runtime. Is that correct? Uh, to a point, yes. Um, don't think of it as specifying a version. More about more of specifying a branch. Uh -huh. So, for instance, the known 3.24 runtime. That is not 3.24.0, which is like no release day uh -huh. versions, it's 3.24 something. So when they later do a point release to like fix bugs or pull in security updates or that kind of thing, um, the 3.24 known runtime would track those and include like small changes that are assumed to be not of major risk of progressions. And then if you have uh, an application that then downloads things from out, then those are going to be whatever version is in apt as an installs, right? Yes, in my flat dev prototype, um, it pulls in whatever was available in apt at the time the base tarball was debootstrapped. So Just as it happens. If you have an application which relies on a certain version of a dependency, then it can break if apt changes. Doesn't if it relies on a very, very specific version, um, FlatDev does not currently handle that. It could. It could, it could have a lockstep dependency, but I haven't implemented that yet. Uh -huh. um, but I would expect that the normal thing is that you would specify a Debian suite, like um, Stretch or Buster, and leave it at that, and then it would pull in whatever security or bug fix updates have happened in that suite at the time the app is rebuilt, and you just periodically rebuild your app to pick up the latest. Okay, I'll talk to you later if you have questions. Sure. Uh, it sounds like we're going to end up with your, your average Debian stable desktop running flat packs using maybe three or four different runtimes, like the Debian one, the known one, just because that's what they need to make their apps work. Potentially. Are we going to... If we discover, if there's a security flaw discovered in one of the main libraries, do we now have to patch, does our security team now have to patch it in four places? Because that's going to be a big workload increase. So the runtimes that we produce, uh, we are responsible for respinning those. Um, if we're building them from app packages like I am in FlatDev, then uh, the security team would have to issue a new dev and then um, you know, press the button to rebuild the runtimes, and it would pull in that security update. Mm -hmm. um, or to rebuild the app if the app bundles it. 
that should hopefully be really automated. Um, if GNOME have their runtime, that's not our problem. GNOME are responsible for updating that. Uh, how this works in terms of Debian policy, I don't know. We might want a policy that by default we only enable Debian maintained runtimes. I don't know. Um, but if the user or the sysadmin um, has chosen to trust GNOME or FlatHub as, a, as their source of packages, then they are trusting um, FlatHub's process for updating, for issuing security updates, not ours. Okay, so if you want to use a non Debian, um, you're definitely going to have to pull it. You're going to have to download it, as you just did in this demo. It's not going to come from one of our repos. Uh, I would assume that, yes. Okay. Uh, I, I am, I'm providing a mechanism here, not policy. <laughs> I'm interested in some policy questions, actually, so, yeah, sort of related to what you just said. Can you imagine, I don't know, what, do you have a, a position on whether Debian could ever get to a place where it's enabling non-Debian non runtimes, by de non-Debian remotes by default? So, for example, your example with GNOME Minds, right? It's not very interesting for distros to be in the space of packaging that kind of apps, right? Mm -hmm. But we, it's also kind of annoying if every Debian user has to go and find out how to enable an external source to find these, to find these things. So do you think, I don't know, I, I feel like there's an argument for, you know, for putting this stuff in by default, but there's also obviously very many, as we just heard, very many interesting arguments contrary to this as well. So I yes, I could see both sides of this. Um, the people setting up FlatHub they are very much setting it up, um, trying their hardest to make it something that distributions can feel comfortable about enabling by default. Um, it does contain some non-free software. It's, it's free software and non-free software. Um, but they've made sure that um, the packages are tagged according to their freeness. I can't remember which, which one it is that has the tag, but it is possible to tell in a machine-readable way. And the idea is that, for instance, no, um, if we were to enable FlatHub by default, um, GNOME software, for instance, would by default hide all the non-free stuff and then have some preference to show it. Probably the same preference that controls whether we enable contrib and non-free for app sources. That would seem the simplest way. Um, so about console applications, is there any um, thing Barring console applications from being flat packed, and the other question is: Is there any use case for having console applications flat packed? Um, I, in principle, there is nothing to stop you um, having a flat pack app that is um, console based. I mean, here is GNU Hello. It doesn't have a whole lot of GUI. Um, the question is: Do you want to? Um, I kind of think that there's not a whole lot of use case for it because um, you know the, the intention for these things is that primarily that's the sort of things that would show up in your app store, they're the sort of things that would show up in GNOME software and I'm not sure how much sense it makes having most console applications be like directly visible to non-technical users in that way. If you if, if you are happy enough about the, about the terminal, um, and you're very much not Cosmo's user base, um, if you're happy, happy enough about the terminal to run your console app, like Ursi or whatever, um, you're probably also happy about the terminal enough to find out how to install it. Um, I don't know whether this means these should be flat packs, just not visible by default in the GUI, or whether this means they should just be can you know, continue to be apt or whatever? Yeah, so I'm going to think you have to catch the rest of the talk because we're we are over time right now, so I think you have to catch the rest of the talk. We're over time, stop. We're out of time. Right. We should